But I thought I'd take you through my journey since this is kind of manifesting or creating the life you love. Uh, brought some books for everyone as well. It's right up my alley. Um, the reason I like to talk you through my journey is not only to show you how to uh, evolve as a human being and how meaningless most of the things that you think are meaningful are, but also to keep your options open, your point of entry, how if you trust and put faith in what you want, uh, what you want will happen. And people that put faith in what they don't want usually get what they don't want. And so uh, who here has heard me speak before? Oh, that's awesome. Oh, really, Marissa? <laughs> Good. That makes it easy. Awesome. So I'll start at the beginning then. I, I was born in Akron, Ohio. So that's enough to feel sorry for me, right? Uh, me and LeBron James were born in the same hospital. Same hospital as Steph Curry. So I imagine, considering my career, eventually I'll be the commissioner of basketball. There must be something special at the hospital. Uh, I grew up with a single mom. My dad left when I was five. Six kids. My mom's extreme academic. She was a second grade teacher. So her philosophy in life was really simple. Number one, the fetus isn't fully developed till after graduate school. And you're either a doctor, a lawyer, or a failure. Uh, and all my siblings kind of followed that direction, which ended them all up in the Ivy Leagues. In fact, all but one graduated summa cum laude uh, from Harvard, Penn, Columbia. Uh, they're extreme academics. One of the things that pissed me off most in my life, including when I was young, is I used to always tell people that I wasn't smart. Uh, I got one B in high school. I think I got a 1490 on my SAT which was far below everyone else in my family. But I was under the understanding that because I didn't get good grades, and those might sound like good grades to you, but in my mind, that I wasn't smart. I like to play football. Uh, I personally believe that you're just academically inclined. You're a good student. I, I truly believe if anyone, I can coach you if you like. If you want to get all A's, I can coach you to be a good student. And you can get all A's regardless of what your intelligence is, your emotional intelligence, your academic intelligence. It's how hard you want to work. Uh, I could teach you how to do that. But I grew up, uh, unlike my siblings, I wanted to really just be one thing. I wanted to be rich. That's really my life goal. Uh, anyone here want to be rich? Honestly? Yeah, good. I think it's important to want to be rich. I think money is really important. As my philosophy of money has changed, why it's important, but I think money's really important. Uh, I wanted to be rich for one reason, though. I just wanted to buy my mom a house and a car. The only time I wasn't happy, we had a two-bedroom apartment with six kids, but I was super happy. I had this great mom, great siblings, great family, sometimes not enough food. I definitely didn't get to dress up very much. I can't remember when I got something new. A big, big day out for me was going to McDonald's, getting two large french fries for six kids, pouring it into a bowl. bowl. But in my perspective, I was just as happy as probably my kids are when I take them to you know, Mastro's in Newport Beach. Uh, it's just a perspective thing. But the only time I wasn't happy was when I caught my mom crying because the car would break. Uh, we didn't have enough money for food. She worked two jobs. Uh, she was a teacher, and then she filled up uh, greeting cards in a turnstile at the 7-Eleven. So she would pack us when we got home from school into a station wagon, pack dinner. So peanut butter and jelly, bologna, and had the older siblings read to the younger siblings. I was completely resistant. I would just not study, not listen, and tell my older siblings that I was going to be rich. And they'd ask me how. I would tell them I was going to be a professional football player. Uh, now, which is odd because I'm sure my daughter will even tell you this. I'm probably the best athlete in my family, and I'm also probably one of the taller people of my family. So it wasn't as if I had you know, some father that left to go join the NBA. I don't know why I thought I could be a football player, but I think I just wanted to distinguish myself from my siblings who were so academic. I worked really, really hard uh, at sports because I didn't have a lot of skills. I had a huge desire, and I actually got a scholarship to college. I found one skill that was useful in football. That was I could run fast, uh, usually faster than most people could angry. I weighed about 147 pounds. Uh, I learned to maneuver myself well because I had a really big mouth and older brothers and I would talk a lot of trash to them and then juke and jive around the two bedroom apartments. So when I got onto a football field, it seemed big. Uh, 
My very first game in college is when my life career goals changed. I uh, played uh, my very first game, the bullet on the kickoff team. Do we know what the kickoff team is? So the guy on the very end is the fastest guy on the team, and you're supposed to run down and talk, tackle the returner. So I'm flying down, adrenaline flying, dreams of playing for the San Diego Chargers. And sure enough, I get there almost as the ball arrives, and I just smash into the ball carrier. Next thing I know, I'm being flipped back onto my back, literally like a fly, just with his right thigh. And then to make things worse, the running back stepped on me. I remember lying there thinking, doctor, lawyer, or failure. Like, my dreams were crushed. Like, how could someone be that good at football? You know, like, it, it just, it was a whole nother game. Uh, that running back ended up being Christian Okoye, uh, who was better known as the Nigerian Nightmare. He was the AFC running back of the year the next year. So he was about 260 pounds, an Olympic hammer thrower, as well as you know, who knows how strong and fast he was. But the interesting thing for me is I then immediately went, uh, because of fear, into thinking that my dreams were dead. And so I went and I thought, doctor, lawyer, failure, I'm going to go visit my older brother. I was pre-med, and I figured I'd be a doctor. And I'd make a lot of money and buy my mom a house and a car. I went to visit my brother in the hospital. He was doing his residency. And the first thing I told him when I got to the hospital was that I hated hospitals. Uh, I'm what they call an empathetic. You'll see probably today twice, I'll cry. I feel people, so I can't be in a hospital because if someone's injured, I feel it. You know, you could imagine if there was an emergency and you were bringing your child in, the last thing you want the doctor to do is start crying, going, oh my God, that looks horrible. That would be me as a doctor. Um, my brother looked at me in shock though when I told him I hated hospitals. He goes, how are you gonna be a doctor if you hate hospitals? I was 18 years old. Uh, some of you are freshmen, you may identify with this, but I literally didn't think about it. I thought I'd be a sports doctor and that meant that I could be in class and then go to a team and learn about how to be a sports doctor. I didn't realize you had to spend 12 years in a hospital, no matter what kind of doctor that you wanted to be. My brother gave me a great piece of advice though, especially in your life journey. Be more interested than interesting. Later on in life, way later on in life, uh, I manifested a dream job of mine, which was I was CEO of Lee Steinberg Sports Entertainment. Uh, it's the most notable sports agency in the world. And the thing that was most difficult for me was so many people, all ages, believe it or not, 18, 28, 38, 48, and 58, would come up to me and say, oh my God, you know, they made the movie Jerry Maguire about my firm. I want to be just like you, Mr. Meltzer. I want to be a sports agent just like you. And I just always remember my older brother be more interested than interesting because they knew nothing about being a sports agent. It's so amazing how many times we create some sort of perspective or an illusion about what we want to be and we don't know anything about it. We might have seen a TV show, a movie, listened to a podcast, read a book from someone, but without really knowing what skills do I need to be that? What knowledge should I acquire and what desire does it take? And so, I immediately turned to the great sage advice of my mom again, doctor, lawyer, or failure, and I decided I'd be a lawyer. I applied to all types of law schools. I did really well in college. I became a student. I started realizing that my siblings weren't smarter than me. They were just better students. So I became a really good student in college. I got into a ton of different law schools. I thought I'd go to probably Georgetown, but um, I, was, I got a fellowship in between college and law school to work for Major League Baseball. Uh, I got that through relationships. I had a friend that I played baseball with whose dad was the general manager of the Padres. I asked him if he would give me a recommendation for a fellowship. He said, better than that, I used to coach with the president of the American League, a man named Bobby Brown. Let's get him to give you that. I ended up not getting the fellowship, but Bobby Brown loved the idea and funded it himself for me to travel to every stadium and do research on antisocial behavior. These are all lessons how things in my life that most people don't do ended up being these extraordinary experiences just because I imagined it, I took action, and I asked for help. Uh, anyway, I came to Tulane. Tulane was my backup choice in law schools. The only reason I applied to Tulane is that I had gone one semester to Georgetown and met a kid from Tulane who was a friend of mine, 
and he told me that Tulane was the greatest place on earth. And he told me that if I didn't apply to Tulane Law School, that I was the biggest idiot, that knowing my personality and who I was, that I would love Tulane. It would be extraordinary for me. And just as a backup, I applied to Tulane. When I came to Tulane Law School, the first person I met was the dean of the law school. I didn't know he was a dean. His name was Dean Kramer. And he came up to me, super friendly, and he said, hey, can I help you? I'm sitting in the old law school, which is next to the basketball arena. And I said, yeah, I got accepted to law school here. I'm traveling with Major League Baseball. And I just wanted to learn a little bit. My friend says this is the greatest place on earth. I think I'm gonna go to Georgetown Law School, but I'm really interested in civil in common law, like how does that apply to international law? And he said, well, I'm Dean Kramer. I used to work at Georgetown. I'm now the de dean here. Can I take you to lunch? And so this giant man took me to lunch and he was awesome. He ordered, he went to Taqueria Corona, which I think they still have. And he ordered two entrees and a bucket of beer. And so I'm 22 years old, just graduated college. And this man ordered two entrees and a bucket of beer. And then I'm thinking, whoa, how cool is that? This is the dean of the law school? And then he looked at me and said, what do you want? <laughs> and I was like, he's super cool. Um, <laughs> the reason I went to Tulane, though, was because of a personal relationship. He said one thing that changed my decision. He said to me, if you come to Tulane, David, I will take care of you. I will take care of you if you come to Tulane. And the reason I thought that was so important is regardless of what people perceive in life, there's relationships. As I look back, whether it was elementary school teachers, coaches, high school teachers, professors in college, deans, those are the people that made the difference in my life. Regardless of the name, the stature, you know, whatever, the program, the major, you know, look at the great alumni here, what their majors were. I promise you they are nothing, nothing like their careers. I have more law school friends that are successful outside of practicing law than practicing in law. Uh, but I went here because the dean told me he was going to take care of me. And I ended up in an extraordinary opportunity because the dean took care of me. Uh, when I graduated Tulane, I did very well here. I had two job offers. One was to be an oil and gas litigator, which is really why I came here. There wasn't really sports law back then. They had a, a, a club or whatever. It's not like it is today, one of the leading sports law programs in, in the country, if not the world. But I was really, that was a lottery ticket idea. I was going to be an oil and gas litigator. I was on moot court. I was a great litigator. But the dean had me meet uh, Professor Yiannopoulos, who was an admiralty lawyer. And they came to me and said, hey, there's this new thing called the internet. There's this company called Westlaw. Uh, Ianopoulos was the biggest publisher. He wrote the Louisiana Code, which is the civil code, made millions of dollars publishing this code as an author here at Tulane. Was a very wealthy professor. He took kids to, to Greece every summer, which he took me as well. And so I went home and he said, you gotta apply for this job to sell legal research online. Now most kids, and there was a few other kids that he offered it to. He said, I'll get you the interview it's a high paying job, and I was the only one that took it. Everyone else was like, ah, I'm not gonna do that. Well, I went up, out of 2,500 people, they wanted somebody uh, that had uh, four years of litigation experience. The thing they liked most about my resume, though, because I know this is this type of course, is really interesting. <coughs> Two things they pointed out. I had a very high GPA, didn't give a shit. I went to Tulane Law School, really didn't care. I was on moot court, Semi-interested, but there's about 2,000 people that practiced law four years and went to Ivy League schools and were on moot court, great legal academics. What made the difference on my resume was when I was in college, I needed money. I, I had a scholarship, but I needed money, and so I was a natural salesperson. I sold books. Uh, basically, there's this company that bought leads from hospitals for new, new parents. When the babies were born, they would sell the names of the newborn. And so you would get an appointment or two a night and you'd go to the house of these like 20 something year old parents or 30 something year old with their new baby. And I'd go in and tell them how important education was and that I had an educational system for them that I would send books that you read to your baby, you know, when they're 
just born and that I give them the whole story about six kids, Ivy Leagues. I was the low end of the gene pool, but yet, you know, I was going to go into law school. And then, you know, you get the Pip and Sis books as they get older. And then when they get even older than that, there's a bookshelf and encyclopedias that came. And, you know, just for $50 a month for the rest of your life, you could finance this educational system. That sounds funny, but the coolest part about it was if you take 18 years times $50 a month, it's a ton of money. And my commissions were huge. And I was good at it. So I made all this money in college, one or two nights, going out selling these things while I was playing football, while I was going to school. And then in law school, I really needed money because I took law loans. And I got a job from 4 a.m. to 9 a.m. before I went to the law firm to sell uh, tennis shoes, Roadrunner Sports. I take incoming calls from the East Coast. You know, Roadrunner Sports, your number one superstore, how can I help you? Upselling Thurlow socks and telling them they need two pairs of shoes because if you rotate your shoes, the carbon in the soles, right? Well, I made more money selling in those five hours than I did working for the law firm as a clerk. Moreover, though, I had learned a skill and proven it as a sales rep and it really interested these people at, at the job. Now, in my life's journey, like every other 18 to 22 year old, I never thought that would mean anything. It was just money, right? I wanted to make money. Meanwhile, I ended up getting the job. Uh, nine months after I got that job, oh, by the way, I went to my mom <coughs> and I asked her what job I should take. L oil and gas litigator or selling legal books, right, online. Nobody even knew what the internet was then. My mom, without blinking, said, you better be a real lawyer because the internet's a fad. This is not gonna work. I would have listened to my mom, but for Professor Yiannopoulos and Dean Kramer said, no, 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 no. The internet's not a fad, David. We have much more situational knowledge. I know your mom loves you, but you're making a huge mistake. You're gonna make so much money. You're born to do this. I'm like, well, I went to law school. My mom's telling me that, you know, everyone's always going to, then take the bar. You know, take the bar and tell your mom, if you suck at this, a year from now, you'll be a real lawyer. Just make a bargain to take the bar, pass the bar, and take this job. They convinced me to do it. And lo and behold, nine months out of law school, the internet was not a fad. In fact, West Publishing and Westlaw was not a fad. Nine months out of law school, they had to switch my comp plan because I'd made a million dollars. I bought my mom a house and a car. Uh, I paid off my law loans and I bought a big screen TV. Back then they were like $8,000 by the way. And I thought at that point, no matter what I do from this point on in my life, I'm a huge success. In fact, my perspective, which is so important in this class, in this journey, my perspective when I was in law school before I got a job, I was so worried about, does anyone here have loans in school? <laughs> I was so worried about having loans that I prayed to God, this is true, when I was applying for jobs and nobody was answering me, I was praying to God that if he would give me a job that would pay back my law loans and somehow buy my mom a house and a car, that I would shovel, excuse my language, shit six days a week, 12 hours a day with gratitude. Like literally, that was my mindset. I would make that prayer. That that's where my mindset, I just, I worked so hard, I remember telling myself, Forget law, forget the big selling, forget everything. That's where my mindset was. My mindset was I was going to buy my mom a house and a car. And to nine months later, be able to do that by traveling around the country, talking to lawyers, selling online and CD-ROMs, it didn't seem real to me. Uh, I continued to work hard. In 1995, uh, West Publishing, sold to Thomson Reuters for $3.4 billion, uh, which changed my economic uh, position even more, which also gave me an opportunity to be the youngest executive at Thomson Reuters. Once again, a lot of people say, man, you're lucky, right? I is it really luck? Mike Tannenbaum is a friend of mine. He's a general manager of the Jets, now executive with the Dolphins, and he always talks about luck. And I remember Mike and I graduating and I, wanting, I wanted to work in sports, but I wanted to be rich. And Mike got a job with the Saints, 
and he, he had the same Jewish parents that I had, same pressures that I had, and he took a job for $600 a month. Every person that I know, it, it seems so fast and everyone sees where you end up, but they don't remember all the lucky things we did, the lucky things like waking up at four in the morning and selling tennis shoes, or the lucky things that we do, the lucky things. I have a friend that invented Pictionary. Anyone know that game, Pictionary? And I still fall into the trap because I've known him for years and I've always made a joke, man, this guy has an unconscious competency of making money. He like fell out of bed, he was a bartender, came home at night playing a game. He's the only one I know to make $30 million with a piece of paper and a pencil. But when I learned his story, it took him 17 years. He said nobody was there when I was standing at the bottom of the escalator at Nordstrom's trying to push my game and nobody understood it and was telling me, you know, there's no way people will buy this game. Like this, this is everybody's story. My business partner is a guy named Warren Moon. Uh, Warren Moon is a Hall of Fame football player. And most of us are too young to remember, but way back when in 1978, when he graduated from uh, the University of Washington, he was the MVP of the Rose Bowl. He was a 16 and a half point favor uh, underdog in the Rose Bowl against what team, do you know? Michigan. Yeah, Michigan. In fact, the Michigan quarterback, the tradition at the Rose Bowl was the quarterbacks of both teams would meet at Disneyland two days before the Rose Bowl in front of Mickey Mouse right in the front, take a picture, wish each other luck. The Michigan quarterback refused to meet with Warren because he was a black quarterback. Anyway, Warren Moon won that game, became MVP, and then he was rewarded by the NFL because they said African Americans weren't intelligent enough to be quarterbacks, so you could be a wide receiver and we'll pay you a million dollars to be a wide receiver in the NFL. Well, my partner said no. So he went to Canada. Imagine how lucky my partner is. First African American in the Hall of Fame, played till he was 44, set every single record in the NFL as well as the CFL. But everybody forgets especially younger people, imagine spending your first year in Edmonton, Canada, and winning the Grey Cup, and then going back to the NFL and saying, see, I'm intelligent enough to play quarterback. I just set every record in the CFL, didn't lose a game, and won the, the Grey Cup. Can I now have an opportunity to play with everyone else? No. Sorry. Year two, same thing, Grey Cup. In Edmonton. This guy's from Los Angeles. Year three, same thing. Year four, same thing. Year five, same thing. Year six. Imagine how lucky Warren Moon is, how lucky he was to have the great opportunity to be in the Hall of Fame, how easy it must have been because he was born with all this talent. Imagine when you're sitting there going, things aren't quite going my way. Like, I can't even imagine, I, I meet entrepreneurs all the time with these great stories like mine, all the sacrifice and all and the enjoyment of the consistent, persistent pursuit of your potential. True happiness, enjoying trying to do what you do. I just can't even fathom. And then finally getting an opportunity. He'll tell you that without those six years, he probably wouldn't be in the Hall of Fame. That every year that he kept working towards it just strengthened him to be the best. That if he would have been drafted, he may have just been an average NFL player. All of the things work in your favor, not against you. Although it's the general acknowledgement from most people that, oh, this isn't going my way. This is hard. This is hard. It's the, I take the opposite approach. This is when it's getting good. There's a story. Has anyone heard the story about the caterpillar? Caterpillar, there's a, a farmer. He sits down for his lunch break underneath a tree. And he noticed there's a caterpillar, now a butterfly, trying to break out of the cocoon. So he leans over, takes his pocket knife, and he cuts the cocoon to help the butterfly. Well, the butterfly flops out of the cocoon, and unfortunately, he kills the butterfly. The reason he killed the butterfly is that nature, the universe, the cocoon is there for a reason. It allows the butterfly to strengthen itself by continually trying to get out of the cocoon. And when it's finally strong enough to fly, it's strong enough through nature to break out of the cocoon so it can fly. 
That's exactly what's occurring right now when you're doubting yourselves, worried about what you're going to do, wondering how I'm going to get there, all those different things of what's going on. You're just strengthening yourself for something much better. That's, it's just in your mindset. And I always believe that. I always believe that. In fact, unfortunately, my life continued in that direction. I, everything, I was like Midas. Company sold for $3.4 billion. Then I went to the Silicon Valley, taking more opportunities, using my skill, which was sales, to raise money. I raised $169 million for a startup. Everything went my way, including I married the girl that I was in love with in the fourth grade who hated me, who I threw an egg at. My wife's the first girl I ever asked to go steady, and she said no, so I threw an egg at her. And hopefully she's the last girl I asked to go steady. But that is just literally my whole life went that way. And then finally at 32 years old, um, I became the CEO of Samsung's first phone division. Now, to me, it's still one of the most surprising things in my life because to this day, I was the CEO of the world's first smartphone. It was a Samsung device, Windows CE. I hung out with Gates and Jobs and Dell and anyone you can think of and literally I have no technology background at all. None. None. The world's first smartphone. I'm multi-millionaire at 32 years old, and I have no engineering background at all. I know the business of technology. I know how to sell. And continuing on, you would think my life would be great. I married the girl of my dreams. I ended up having, at that time, three beautiful girls. But it wasn't. Because for the first time in my life, when I had every single thing, I wasn't happy. I just lost all of my intent of what I was doing with my life. I had no intent. So what did I do? Like most people, athletes, celebrities, I surrounded myself with the wrong people and the wrong ideas. I had built over a $100 million portfolio, and I lost everything. It took a long time to lose everything, about two and a half years. But... I changed my life at that time. I changed my mindset. It's still the best thing that ever happened to me. I think it saved my life, uh, losing everything. My wife, about two years before I went bankrupt, I became CEO of Lee Steinberg Sports and Entertainment. Once again, just helping someone, keeping my options open, having the skills, knowledge. When he met me, he offered me the job within 48 hours when he met me. I wasn't looking for it. That wasn't luck. He meets people all the time. He has 2,500 resumes like I do every single month on my plate. It wasn't luck. It was that I had lived my life building skills, knowledge, and having the desire, and he had attracted and offered it to me for a reason, right? Because I could provide value to him. Well, my wife told me two years before I lost everything that I needed to take stock in who I was and what I wanted to become. And I realized there was four things that I needed to live my life by. Number one, gratitude, which is the most powerful thing that you can have. Very simple things happen with gratitude, like I get to come, not I have to do this, right? I get to do this, not I have to do this. When you're stopped at a red light, thank you. All the things in my life had changed through gratitude, forgiveness. Everybody makes mistakes. Only one person to forgive. Do you know who it is? Yourself. Because you can't give what you don't have. That's why I believe in money. Because I can't give what I don't have. And my whole life is to provide value to other people, to be of service. My whole life is spent trusting the universe that if I can acquire more and more and more, allow it to come through me and appreciate it with gratitude and add value to it and give it away, then I'll expand to receive more and more. It's literally a philosophy that works so well. As much as I lost, it took me no time to gain it back the right way. I went from being a manipulator, somebody that could oversell, back end sell, lie, cheat, into a motivator, somebody that was of service, that inspires others to inspire others. Uh, when I finally lost everything, hey guys, <laughs> when, I fi when I finally lost everything, uh, I had completely transformed. I called it a quantum shift. I lived my life of service. I wake up every morning praying to God for 10 people that I can help. A real simple prayer. I meditate every day. Uh, I think people are misguided to understand what getting out of your own way or surrendering is. I'm probably one of the most active people that you'll ever meet. I'm one of the most productive 
people you'll ever meet. I'm one of the most accessible people you'll ever meet. I am accessible to others and I access what I want. I have an extraordinary life through this philosophy. I'm very pragmatic about what I do, but I stick to the trust in the universe that I'm here to provide value, to be of service. I also realize that I'm a hypocrite. Right? I'm on my journey. I, you know, it's harder and harder. I have a TV show, a podcast. I run a huge sports marketing agency, media company, uh, write books, speak around the world, do tons of business coaching. So basically all day long I'm helping people and giving advice. And a lot of times I'm still following my own advice. I'm just doing the best that I can. I'm trying to get back to center. I'm trying consistently to understand my ego the need to be right, the need to be offended, the need to be resentful, the need to be separate, inferior, superior, the need to be scared, anxious, frustrated, angry, to have grievances, to attack other people. All of those different things I do almost every day. And it's okay because the difference between me now and me 30 years ago is my goal is to how quickly can I get back to center. I don't waste all the time, resources, money, and relationships trying to go in the wrong direction. If you know where your center is, if you know where peace is, if you know where the truth is, if you can consistently every day, persistently, without quit, pursue your potential, your truth, you'll know when you're off. Right? This void, this shortage, this distance, this trajectory is your ego. And what happens is we start putting faith into all that void, all the shortages, resistance, and then we wonder why so many things don't happen as quickly as we want. Things don't happen as quickly as you want, mostly because we don't have the right perception of time. We don't understand exponential growth and acceleration. And I think it's really important. I wish somebody would have explained this to me when I was young. Um, imagine this, and I tell this story. How much time do I have, Bradley? Five minutes, perfect. Sorry I didn't save time for questions. You can DM me, I'll answer them. Uh, anyway, here's what I started realizing in life. And this is why people never get to where they want. So many people, they don't. Number one, they don't know what they want. About 80 some people never think about exactly what I want. You should pay attention to that every day. You should be asking yourself. And it can change every day. That's fine. Another 12% or so, they don't know why they want it. They, they're in that 80 some percentile. They know what they want, but they don't know why. And then the remaining 2% never think about how. Right? They're great innovators, great ideas, but they have no discipline, no strategy, and no awareness. I believe it's a matter of time. Everybody has 24 hours, 24 hours of activity. I look at it with a lens of productivity and accessibility. How productive am I gonna be with my 24 hours? How accessible am I to be of service to others? And how am I accessing what I want? Am I asking, do you know anyone that could help me? There's so many places that you can get information. Here's the difficulty when you're your age, is that right now you might know what you want. And 10 years from now, when you're 30 years old, you look at your life and you've worked 10 years towards it and you say to yourself, wow, I'm only a quarter of the way where I want to be. I'm never going to get there. And either people quit or they change their mind or they don't have that unbelievable determination, that persistence to do it every day because they're passionate and they love it, not because they're supposed to. But if you're a quarter of the way there and you understand exponential growth and acceleration, let me tell you what happens. Exponential growth and acceleration tell me that in 10 years, if I'm 25% of the way there, in five more years, I might be 50% of the way there. Now, even if people can get that, and now they're 15 years, 35 years old, and they're on their consistent, persistent pursuit, and they've enjoyed it, there's still those people that say, wow, I'm 35 years old, I'm only halfway there. Now it's too late to change, right? Void, shortages, obstacles, resistance, I'm married. I, Here's the saddest thing. This is what exponential growth and acceleration tell me. 10 years, I'm 25%. Five years, right, I'm now 50% of the way. Guess what? In two and a half years, when I'm 37 and a half years old, I get to be 100% of the way there. That's exponential growth. That's acceleration. It's so sad. And guess what? When you're 37 and a half years old, now everybody goes, oh my God, she's so lucky. You're, you're so lucky. You have everything that you wanted. 
and you're only 37. Now, meanwhile, when the 35-year-old was there before they were 37 and a half, it's like, are you ever going to get there? I told you not to go to law school. I told you not to take, right? Once again, back into the three biggest traps of human nature. One, we think we are what we do. Two, we think we are what we have. And three, we think what other people think matters about us. They don't understand acceleration. They don't understand exponential growth. Here's the coolest part about being 37 and a half, and I've been there with every single thing that you want. In only a year and a quarter, at 38 and three quarters, you have twice as much as you ever wanted. And in only nine months after that, you have four times as much as you wanted. And only four and a half times after that, you have eight times what you wanted. If you want to know how the hell does someone make a hundred billion dollars through acceleration and exponential growth, it's through belief, it's through knowledge, skills, and desire, it's through that literally I'm enjoying through gratitude, empathy, forgiveness, accountability, where everything is attracted to me and I'm supposed to learn from it. They're all miracles. I give awards and bonuses for making mistakes once, not twice. And then most importantly, through this process of acceleration and exponential growth, living an inspired life. I only look one way. I look to what inspires me. If I don't feel inspired, I stop what I'm doing and I figure it out what rocks my world. I promise you, you would not imagine what I've done in the last 48 hours and right now is the most inspired I've been all day. Most inspired I've been all day. I took the red eye in. I won't tell you what I did yesterday in San Francisco or the day before, but this is what rocks me because I'm connected right now to what inspires me and I know I can add value to it and give it to you and hopefully, whether you believe it or not, I have planted a seed that whether you're 20, 25, 30, 35, or 40, every single one of you will go, ah, this is what he meant. And that change will impact you dramatically, just like all the people that planted seeds in my head that from bosses to teachers to professors to dean were like, ah, what is he, high? Like that guy came in at five o'clock on a Thursday night, I should be at the boot, and he's talking about inspirational crap. What does he know? He lost $100 million. Yeah, I also made it back faster than the first time because I understand acceleration. I understand exponential growth. I understand and trust the universe. Do I trust it all the time? Not a chance. I built two community centers in Africa last year. Money does not buy happiness, but it allows you to shop. I learned to shop for the right things. I want all of you to have what you want. Learn from it. Move on. You don't have to believe anything I'm saying except for I'm telling you enjoy the consistent everyday persistent without quit pursuit of whatever potential it is that you want. Doctor, lawyer, failure, I don't care. Football player, esports superstar, general manager of the Pelicans, whatever it is that you think your potential is, just enjoy the consistent persistent pursuit of it. You know, I do a little bit of coaching with Samir who's your top basketball player here and it's amazing as much as he knows as much as he reads as hard as and productive as he works he still has the young person problem of he's what I don't know where I'm going to be in six years what should I what should I do in six years I'm like six years man I don't know what the hell I'm doing in six years and I've been in this game a long time I'm worried about every day staying focused and enjoying it there is no such thing as work period. There's activity you get paid for and activity that you don't get paid for. If you're into money, maximize the activity you get paid for. But enjoy the activities you're in. If you're not enjoying it, infuse it with purpose. Don't do something else. Infuse it with purpose. Change your perspective. I made taking out the trash fun. I decided every time I took out the trash, which I hated, that I would think about what I wanted. I'd take the time to think what I wanted. I started practicing what I preach as far as doing good deeds because it made me feel good when I stopped and picked up trash and threw it away, when I took an extra moment to hold a door, when I smiled at someone and said, what's your name? Are you having a good day? Is there anything I can do to be of service for you? Can I help you? The last piece of advice is I have one minute and it's the one that I wish somebody would tell, have told me and people ask me, what advice would you give to your 18-year-old self? 
It's the same advice that I give to my 51-year-old self every day. Ask for help. If you're going to write down two words for your nightstand, try radical humility. Radical humility. Ask for help. Ask someone, do you know anyone that can help me? Find someone that sits in the situation that you want to be in. Someone that has the capacity, situational knowledge, or relationship capital to help you and give them a gift. Give them a gift and ask them for help. Because I will tell you, I have the biggest gift in the world. I'm one of the richest people you'll ever meet. Not because my bank account says so, because I have a list of people every day that give me the greatest gift and compliment that you could receive. Hey man, I need your help. That feels so good to me that somebody needs me. That they respect me enough to say, hey, I, I, I have all these people like this that I can talk to, but I need your help. Can you give me your advice or do you know anyone that can help me? Give that gift. When you're young, give that gift. I couldn't believe when I went to career day and did that keynote and we had those career coaches and I asked them, they're standing there in the room like this. I'm like, hey, do you get paid? They're like, yeah, this is my full-time job. You're, you're, what's your job? I'm supposed to help kids get jobs. They're like, that seems like a good objective to go to college to get a job. I'm all, you must be overwhelmingly busy, right? Your school is paying you a ton of money to help kids get jobs. You must be busy. And the answer was... No, I don't know any of these kids. But yet, they're all DMing me. Can I get a job? Ask for help. It's really simple. I don't have to teach you to be of service. You all love to give and help people. That's easy for you. But all of you have a problem asking for help. And the easiest way to create the acceleration and exponential growth in your life is to find someone that sits in the situation that you want to be in, that has the knowledge, the capability that you want to have, or has the ability to inspire you so you can create momentum in your life, inspiration in your own life, and ask them for help. If you need help from me, I'll be back next month to do one-on-ones, check with Byron in the career. I'll be happy to sit down with you, or go ahead and follow me at my name, at David Meltzer, DM me, ask me a question, get on my Instagram live, ask me a question, whatever it is, I will answer you. I will help you. I really appreciate your time. I wish I had more time before I got to the, the next class, but this is, if I was going to take a course at Tulane, I wish they had this one because I didn't even think it was real. And uh, thank you so much.